we are honored to have Dr. Cutler here. He's uh, the pioneer, I would say, in the metabolics uh, field in HIV. Um, I remember Dr. Cutler actually published one of the first papers on the relationship between the loss of lean body mass and wasting syndrome back in the late 80s? Yes? Early 80s. Early 80s. <laughs> so, um, and he's still working uh, full time in the area of li metabolics, uh, lipodystrophy, body composition, and all the uh, related side effects in HIV. So we're honored to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just wanted to get a few um, impressions from you. Uh, we've had a few oral presentations on metabolics and cardiovascular disease in HIV on Monday. And we, I wanted to start with, um, this a study actually poster number 38 oral presentation on the metabolic outcomes of ACTG 5142, a prospected um, randomized phase three trials of uh, the use of nucleosides with a PI and a non-nuke sparing uh, regimen for um, HIV infection. And they found a difference between the effect uh, of Calitra plus nucleosides and versus uh, efavirin, sustiva, or nucleosides on lipoatrophy. And that was, that was a striking finding for me, particularly, because I, I would not expect um, a difference between a non-nuke like sustiva and, and, and calitra uh, with a backbone of nucleosides. What, what are your impressions on, on that study? Well, to be honest, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to a number of colleagues here, and they don't really understand it either. Um, it seems to be a real phenomenon because it was, it was a funny study in which it was Kalitra and, and dual nukes, but the nukes were ones that anyone, that, that the investigators could choose, Zeret, AZT, or Tenofovir, Afavirenz plus two nukes, or Afavirenz plus Kalitra, so they could do nucleoside sparing. And certainly the nucleoside sparing had less lipoatrophy than when you included the nucleosides, and uh, the nucleoside sparing had more lipid abnormalities than the two nucleosides. But no matter how they looked at it, the people with efavirenz tended to have more lipoatrophy than the people who took Kalitra, which is a totally surprising finding. Mm -hmm. There was a, another abstract that was uh, presented maybe an hour later, looking at, at AZT3TC and efavirenz versus AZT3TC and Kalitra, followed by Kalitra monotherapy. Deintensification is what it's called. Mm. And once again, it appeared that Kalitra seemed not to cause much lipoatrophy, whereas the efavirenz arm did. If it weren't for the first study, people would have said, oh, that's just AZT. Yeah. Uh, but there was, some, there was another poster that, that, uh, that was presented um, yesterday in which, in which uh, the basic scientists looking at efficacy actually noticed a, an interaction, a synergy between AZT and, um, and efavirenz mm -hmm. to make the, uh, the AZT stronger. The efavirenz made the AZT stronger by some molecular mechanism that I don't understand. And if I did understand, I probably couldn't describe, so let it sit. But if there's an interaction, if there's a, a synergy in causing um, efficacy, well, maybe there's also some synergy in causing that toxicity, meaning that AZT causes more lipoatrophy when it is associated with efavirenz. It, it doesn't explain all of the ACTG study, but it's actually something new that investigators really hadn't considered before. And I guess what people will now do is go back to all of the other clinical trials in which efavirenz is being used with AZT or not with AZT, and recalculate the data and look at it to see if there really is something there. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting also to find out what the uh, intracellular ACT concentrations are and whether or not mitochondrial toxicity also changes in the presence of efavirenz versus calitra, you know, what the differences are. So I think this is just the beginning right. of this whole area. So thank you very much for the input on that. It's another study, uh, poster number 40, that reviewed the use of polylactic acid, what we call Sculptra, here in the United States. I think they call it New Field in other countries uh, for the use of facial lipoatrophy. And they actually did CT scans of a facial area and they found no statistical significance uh, or growth 
in the tissue, the facial tissue, after how many weeks is this? Uh, I forgot how many weeks, but it's 24 weeks. Yeah. Uh, what are your impressions of that? I mean, what you've seen in New York City, for instance, in your, in your uh, yeah. dealings with patients? I think that you would agree with me. I think that everybody watching would agree with me that, that a picture of somebody's face before and after is all the proof that's needed. Right. That sculpture was not supposed to replace subcutaneous fat. And in fact, in the United States, it's usually used in intradermal injections, mm -hmm. which seems to thicken the skin a little bit rather than thick thicken the subcutaneous tissue mm -hmm. and, and take away that wrinkling that, that seems so obvious and so, mm -hmm. and so stigmatizing. In this study, interestingly enough, the injections were given subcutaneously mm -hmm. rather than into the skin. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it may be that what they were looking for on CT scan is not what's important. It doesn't matter how much the, you know, your cheeks bulge, but rather how they look to, mm -hmm. the, to the eye. Certainly the data on quality of life, mm -hmm. all right, and patient satisfaction mm -hmm. was overwhelmingly in favor of, of the sculpture. And the fact that CT scans didn't show it means that CT scans are probably the wrong measurement mm -hmm. if, you're actually, if you're actually trying to look at or trying to determine whether um, a treatment affects uh, facial lipoatrophy. And also the subcutaneous versus the, versus the sub, you know, intradermal injections may make a big difference too. So hopefully we'll see more research in the area of facial fillers. Actually, I'm yeah. glad to see the first oral presentation in a conference right. to cover facial filler for lipoatrophy. That's, that's amazing. We usually don't see an oral presentation. And if I may, mm -hmm. um, the people I've talked to here say this is, a, this is a question that in many ways has been answered by pictures rather than science. Mm -hmm. um, the hope is that this will have some implication for social policy. That in fact, in fighting for coverage, the fact that a placebo controlled trial was performed or mm -hmm. a randomized trial was performed mm -hmm. and, and showed those benefits, including the quality of life benefits, might give more ammunition in terms of trying to get uh, coverage uh, for people who can't afford to pay for it. I just hope that insurance companies don't catch on the CT results versus the quality of life results. That is the worry. That's a, that's a worry. And that's worry. We've, we're already battling that, the activist community in the United States trying to get reimbursement for facial fillers. So hopefully we'll, we'll see more data, not only on this filler, but second generation fillers like silicone and bioalchemid and PMEA. Um, there are other really interesting studies. There's one on bone health, bone density, and the use of alendronate, or Fosamax, with uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation. And there was um, um, a reasonable increase, a 4% increase in 48 weeks in bone density in these patients. Can you elaborate on, on the study? It's very difficult to understand um, osteopenia and HIV. Certainly, when osteopenia was first recognized, people simply assumed that it was medication related. It soon became clear that osteopenia occurred in people even before they were uh, um, uh, started on heart therapy. And what's osteopenia? I'm sorry, before. Uh, osteopenia is a is a condition of lowered bone density, not as advanced or as serious as osteoporosis. And that's actually a good point to bring up because there is a reason to treat. There is an indication to treat osteoporosis. Osteopenia is osteopenia is a precursor lesion. There is no evidence that suggests that it needs to be treated other than, other than to be followed. But to get back to what I was saying, whereas we first thought this was a complication of, of medication, it, it seems to occur even before mm -hmm. uh, people are started on heart therapy. And whereas we typically think of, of low bone density in terms of things like vitamin D deficiency and not making enough bone, it appears that in HIV, it is more related to bone breakdown, an accelerated break breakdown with the accelerated breakdown being um, um, related to the activity of inflammation and to a specific cell in bone called osteoclasts. Alendronate and the other bisphosphonates as a class act by inhibiting the osteoclasts, so one would expect that they would have an effect on lowering bone uh, breakdown, and that's just what was seen with numbers, with effects that are really not so different than you would Mm -hmm. expect to see in somebody who's not HIV infected. 
Uh, that actually, I think, is one of the, the lessons for this, um, uh, for this meeting, in that we're moving away from saying, oh, it's HIV, or it's medication, to a more complicated view, what they say, nuanced view, in which many things are, are affecting uh, the outcomes that we see, mm -hmm. many of those outcomes really not being so very different than what you would see in the HIV negative mm -hmm. uh, community. And Dr. Cutler, my concern in the bone density area is that um, the lack of use of DEXA scanning as a part of standard of care, I mean, people find out they have a bone density issue, osteopenia, osteoporosis, when they have a fracture, which is a pretty late stage. Uh, what do you think about the, what do we need to do in the activist community to get more uh, diagnostic, diagnostics tools like DEXA scanning prior to seeing problems like fractures? Well, that's, you know, that's an old battle. Mm -hmm. because the same techniques to look at bone density also look at lean mass and body fat. Mm -hmm. And just as we have limited ability um, to, to look at bone density, so we've always had limited ability to look at muscle mass or lean body mass or even fat content and distribution. Uh, those tend not to be um, reimbursed. Mm -hmm. And I think what the activist community has to do is get louder again. There you go. <laughs> and what are there ways to increase bone density besides just getting, taking a drug or taking a vitamin or a calcium uh, supplement? Any, anything other than you can the, tell the, Other the, than the bisphosphonates? Yes. Resistance exercise. Resistance exercise, weight training. Weight training, and some of the anabolic agents, though the anabolic agents seem to have an effect only over a more long-term use. It's, it's not something you're gonna find in 12 weeks or 24 weeks, or maybe even 48 weeks, but really chronic uses and chronic uh, um, exercise resistance exercise is what's important for bone health. Thank you. Um, there's another study number, poster number 43, the effects of uh, uh, D4T, serrate, on insulin sensitivity and mitochondrial function in muscle cells. First time we see data on muscle, it's usually we've seen a lot of data on fat cells before. Correct. And uh, can you elaborate on that study? Very interesting study. Yes, this was a very nice study. Um, and once again, it, 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 it shows how little we know, number one, and number two, it shows how, how, as we learn more, the differences between HIV and non-HIV uh, are not as great as we, th as we think. We typically think of, of type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance as being a complication of obesity. Very nice studies uh, published over the last six or seven years um, looking at the first degree relatives of type 2 diabetics, essentially the children of diabetics, mm -hmm. have shown that insulin resistance precedes obesity. Mm -hmm. It's not the result of obesity. And in fact, that insulin resistance is really a, 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 a genetic problem. And the genetic problem is really related to genes, at least in part, mm -hmm. from the mitochondria. So that there may be a, a congenital mitochondrial defect that leads to insulin, that leads to insulin resistance mm -hmm. and ultimately may lead to diabetes. Mm -hmm. Well, the mitochondrial hypothesis of nucleosides is essentially saying the same thing, that the, that, that the NRTIs uh, affect mitochondrial function. We've looked mostly at, 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 at fat and not at muscle. The group from Mass General, Steve Grinspoon's group, decided to look at muscle, and they did so in a very nice way uh, that, that has been exploited a lot in HIV. That is, they looked at healthy people who were not type 2 diabetics, mm -hmm. who did not have insulin resistance, nor did they even have a family history of insulin resistance. And non HIV. And they didn't have HIV. Mm -hmm. But they were given Xeret. Mm -hmm. And over four weeks, which was all the institutional review board were allowed to, uh, gave them permission yeah. to, to mm -hmm. study, over four weeks, they were able to demonstrate mitochondrial DNA depletion in muscle, mm -hmm. that was determined on biopsies, as well as insulin resistance, that was determined by a fancy glucose tolerance test called a euglycemic clamp. And mm -hmm. that occurred without increasing fat, without changes in body composition without even influencing the amount of fat that's in muscle, which is another a thought of how insulin resistance will occur in muscle. This was a direct effect on, on mitochondria. Mm -hmm. That would mirror what would occur, gen, uh, what would occur genetically. If you, if you think of the early AIDS days when there was, uh, how we, when, when we had to compare congenital immune deficiency versus acquired immune deficiency, well, type two diabetes or insulin resistance may really be a congenital insulin resistance, mm -hmm. 
or an acquired insulin resistance, mm -hmm. and the acquired insulin resistance seems to be a function of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the nucleotides. Mm -hmm. What's nice about this is that it shows that it's occurring both in muscle mm -hmm. as well as fat, and the implication that mitochondrial dysfunction in muscle might have a functional consequence, mm -hmm. so much so that that one outcome that's not been looked at, that could be looked at, would be to see what happens to muscle function mm -hmm. if people were to switch away from the, you know, the, the thymidine analogs. Mm -hmm. What effect that may have on, on, on exercise tolerance, on exercise capacity. VO2 uh, max. And VO2 max. And, and in fact, that is being studied. We're studying it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not nearly the problem in, in, in the United, United States, States mm -hmm. or in the, develop, in the developed world as much as it may be in the developing world because in the developing world, um, there's much more of a need for manual labor and um, the, um, the use of, of antiretrovirals in part is to keep up a healthy labor force. Uh, and it may be that finding a way to optimize muscle function in that healthy labor force will be good for those developing countries. And there also happen to be the ones that are taking more the ACT and the B4Ts. Right. And having more lactic, more acidosis, lactic acidosis. That was seen in a, in, in lipoatrophy that's, that were demonstrated in other, in other I'm very happy to see, finally see some work on muscle tissue and, and, and in, health, in healthy individuals. So I'm wondering what the next step will be. What do you think after, after studies in HIV negatives, besides uh, functional capacity uh, in HIV positives, uh, getting off steroid or ACT or what would be a next step for you besides the work you're doing? Mm -hmm. Or you may want to tell us a little bit more about that. No, that's not, a, that's not necessarily appropriate for here. Okay. I, think, I think the next step is to take the benefits that we're seeing here, all right, the avoidance of, of, of lipoatrophy, and, and, and take it global. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand how the, the, the first line drugs are so much cheaper than, than the second line or the newer drugs that, that, that we're able to treat so many more people. Mm -hmm. But it seems a really bad trade-off. Yes. And I think that those who are fighting for, for cheaper second-line drugs need our support. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe those cheaper second-line drugs, as they become cheaper, can become first-line drugs. That may be, in terms of public health, the best that we could possibly do. Thank you. And lastly, we have a study, uh, 45 LB, uh, from the folks in, at McGill University in Montreal and others looking at the uh, use of growth hormone releasing factor, TH9507, uh, on uh, abdominal fat accumulation and lipodystrophy. Um, kind of exciting because it's a little different. Can you tell us uh, what the differences are between this product and a product like Serostim? Uh, there seems to be a moderate uh, decrease in visceral fat. Um, I think Dr. Um, Fallots or, what was it? Uh, I'm sorry, the burger, right? The, the presenter said there was a difference of three centimeters in waist size, right. and, um, and it seems to be lower when it comes to side effect profile uh, versus serostim. Could you tell us and elaborate, because I think the community will have a lot of interest uh, in this, in this, in this uh, study. <coughs> it's interesting because, because what appears to be more related to HIV is lipoatrophy, and yet we see so many people who have increased visceral fat. Um, and, and certainly in, in Africa, when they talk about lipodystrophy, they're talking about visceral fat. Well, the visceral fat or the metabolic syndrome is a very common disease in, uh, in, in, in the developed world. Uh, 20, 30 percent of people may have it. It has, it's associated with bad outcomes, heart attack, stroke, et cetera. Um, and studies from in, within the past 10 years have shown that a deficiency of growth hormone leads to visceral fat accumulation, all right? Not only that, people who have a lot of visceral fat accumulation under secrete growth hormone. And growth hormone's needed not just to grow from a baby to an adult, but it has ongoing, ongoing functions. Well, Stephen Grinspoon, once again, from Mass General, did a study looking at lipodystrophy with visceral fat accumulation and showed that even in the HIV positive community, increased visceral fat is associated with lowered growth hormone secretion. That really should be the best uh, rationale for using growth hormone, and growth hormone has been used really since, experimentally since 1999. It's not approved for this indication, but what the first studies. For, what is it approved for, Doctor? It's approved for wasting mm -hmm. in HIV. Um, 
but it's not approved for, for lipodystrophy. And, and both the makers of serostim as well as this compound, TH9507, have been looking to, to gather that indication. Uh, it's known that growth hormone replacement in the non-HIV world does lead to a decrease in visceral fat. And studies from several investigators in HIV showed that serostim, growth hormone, also will cause a decrease in visceral fat. And the more you give, the more you get. But the more you give, the more toxicity there is. Growth hormone releasing factor is a different form of, 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 uh, of therapy that preserves the sort of the natural feedback. It is, it is a compound that's normally made in the brain that stimulates the natural release of growth hormone, but the pituitary gland where growth hormone is, comes from can then be turned off again by normal stimuli. It probably gives you less bang for the buck than serostim, but because of that normal feedback inhibition and what's called pulsatile stimulation, it really is more physiologic. So this then is the second study of the, of the TH9507. And in this study, uh, a placebo-controlled trial, randomized two to one to get the active drug, um, there was very nice results with a fall of visceral fat, just like one would expect. Uh, it's sort of about the level of about two milligrams of serostim, or maybe a little bit, a little bit less. Um, though that's the, that's the dose of serostim that, the, that the government at least is pushing. Not high doses, six milligrams like in wasting, but, mm. but low doses like one or two milligrams. What set this apart, though, from the, the serostim data is that it appeared to be, to be somewhat safer. It had less effect on, on, um, Nitrogen, on glucose. And also uh, it had, because of the lower dose, there was less effect on fluid overload and, and ankle swelling and, and, and joint stiffness. Mm -hmm. So it, it seemed to be quite well tolerated. There will be one more study of this, of this drug. Serostim is already in front of, the, of front of the FDA. It's new drug application, so they should hear within a few months whether the drug will be approved, and Thera will then find it. I believe that whereas serostim may be able to give you more effect with a higher dose, Thera might possibly give you more safety because of the physiologic way. What it's going to be for the FDA is to really determine safety and efficacy, if you will, a sweet spot, a sweet spot in which you can give enough of a dose, you can afford enough of a dose to get enough of an effect so that the patient and everyone else notices the benefit, but to do so in the absence of a very serious toxicity. And cost and access is a big issue in this, in this field. Uh, you know, we know how expensive serostim is, and this product will probably be also expensive. My concern is with all the latest data, the FRAM study data and some other data that shows that visceral fat is not that different between HIV negatives and positives. Um, I'm a very concerned as an activist about reimbursement and how insurance companies are going to look at that data and say, well, this is not an HIV-related or medication-related issue, and therefore they're probably, I'm, I'm very concerned about reimbursement. Or they may see this as a, as a cosmetic issue, not as a clinical outcome issue. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done in this field right. for sure, not only on approving drugs like this, but also what happens after approval and who's going to pay for that. So, and also, you know, I'm, I'm um, I'm an exercise advocate, and three centimeters in 26 weeks, you know, maybe we can see the same effects with exercise and, or, or nutritional interventions, but yet most people are not willing to adhere to that kind of a... Well, that's, that's <laughs> number one. And, and, and the other is that, is that there have been two published studies of lifestyle modification or resistance and, 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 and aerobic exercise and interestingly enough, in HIV, and interestingly enough, the, the results are not that great. Mm. You may be able to get some people to lose weight, but, but, but when you do, the, the lipids don't get much better, mm. and, and the insulin resistance doesn't get mm. much better. It's, it doesn't seem to be quite the same mm. as in um, HIV negatives, mm. in which a new diabetic with a lot of visceral fat will often lose their diabetes as they lose their visceral fat. Mm. Now, to go back then to the Zeret uh, abstract that Dr. Grinspoon presented, maybe our lack of good benefit from exercise in the past mm. was related to the nukes. So, the so in the current era in which you're seeing less and less, you might find that the HIV people will act more like non-HIV people. And then combination therapy 
perhaps, of diet, exercise, and maybe some limited anabolic agents, because because the worry is that is that these agents may have to be given forever, mm. and that's I guess what the third party payers are going to choke on. Mm -hmm. If it's a 12 week or a 24 week um, therapy, um, it might be easier to to um, get reimbursed mm -hmm. than if it really is indefinite. Yeah. Well, once again, Dr. Uh, Cutler, Ifara, on behalf of Ifara, I want to thank you for your presence here. You're definitely a supporter of the community, and we'd love you to have you back uh, next year again. Thank you very much for showing up and helping us out. Sure thing, Bill.